Okay, well, here we go with mason bees. Um, first, um, just, I'm just gonna get rid of a window here if I can. Um, yeah. um, this is our farm, Duande Farm, where Don and I live. Um, Don has been on the farm now for about 18 years. I've had the farm myself for 30 years and really started out on the farm um, with animals. I started out raising Highland cattle. Um, and over the years, I, I bred and raised about 30 or 40 Highland calves. We've had horses, dogs, cats, and sheep. We've had sheep since the beginning and still have sheep. Um, we've grown just about every kind of vegetable you can grow. We're, we're known largely for our garlic uh, being a premium supplier of garlic, but we've also done um, farmer's markets, we've done CSA programs, we've done some uh, wholesale marketing of our vegetables. Uh, we, we have a lot of fruit and nut trees. We have apples, pears, plums, peaches, walnuts, hazelnuts, grapes, and blueberries. So we need pollinators. And one of, one of our concerns has always been is just how to make a small farm sustainable and productive uh, we, we did get involved with the bee club, I don't know, I guess it was about four or five years ago. In our first year with bees, we had um, really good success. We didn't do anything to them and they produced a lot of honey. And we thought, aha, this is easy. Uh, the next year, we had a lot of trouble. Uh, we had a bear attack and that demolished one hive. Uh, we got the hives uh, going again, going to the fall but we had trouble and only one hive survived into the next year. Um, the next year we got a couple more nukes and um, going into the fall of that year, uh, we had two healthy hives. Um, one hive disappeared overnight in September. The bees just vacated for some reason. I, I guess they, they may have swarmed, although it was very unlikely that they should swarm at that time of year because we were feeding them at the time and um, there were no uh, queen cells or anything apparent. Uh, the other hive we had basically died around February, all the bees died. So as a result of that, we sort of said, um, maybe we should look at mason bees. Um, just a little bit of background on mason bees. They are native to North America. Uh, they're non-aggressive. They're very much like a black fly in terms of their appearance, uh, a super pollinator and very easy to manage. Um, and some of the stats on them, they do say that 500 mason bees will pollinate an acre of apple trees compared to 75,000 honeybees. Um, one of the reasons for that is when the female bee goes out to flower, she'll visit on each trip, round trip from her home hive and back, she'll visit up to 30 or 40 different uh, trees. Um, one of the advantage of mason bees is we store the larvae uh, in a cocoon in our fridges over the winter, and we can put the larvae out at any time we want in the spring, um, about a week after we put the larvae out or the cocoons, uh, the, the males will hatch and then followed by the females. So we can time the hatch of the mason bees with a particular tree bloom. Um, mason bees also work in cooler weather than honeybees and will emerge a bit earlier. And a big advantage if you're uh, a farmer that has a lot of fruit trees is mason bees prefer fruit trees to other flowers. Um, this is a picture of the mason bee. You can see it looks a lot like a, a black fly. This one has a bit more color than the ones that we have in our farm. It's got a little bit of brown on it, but they're almost indistinguishable from a big black fly. Uh, the females are slightly larger than males. Uh, they are sort of a blue-black in color like a, a regular fly. And it's the females that do all the work. They're the ones that go out and um, gather the pollen. Uh, the mason bee life cycle is interesting. In March, uh, when our first flowers start to emerge on our trees, uh, the bees are ready to emerge from their homes. Uh, the way it works is the male bees emerge first. They come out of their uh, cocoons and fly around and get virile. And then as the females hatch, 
um, the, the um, males will mate with the females. That happens um, shortly after you put them out. Once you put the co cocoons out, uh, that mating will occur in approximately a week to 10 days. The, um, after, after the uh, bees have mated, they will, the females will start to go out and gather pollen and come back to their hives and start laying eggs. And so from the time sort of from March till the end of May will be the time where they'll be uh, laying their pollinating and laying eggs uh, for the next season. Um, once the eggs are laid, and I'll get into the actual structure of the hive in a minute, but the eggs will hatch um, in, their, um, in their home and spin a cocoon and go into metamorphosis uh, by the fall. So by fall, the eggs that were laid by the female will uh, metamorphose into a larvae that's in a cocoon stage that will just stay dormant over the winter. Over the winter, they basically are in hibernation and will stay that way until the springtime. So when the larvae hatch, the males emerge first and fly around. Uh, the females emerge a few days la later. Um, one female will lay about 30 eggs in her life. And it, it's interesting that when the female mates with the male, uh, she can store both uh, fertile or sterile eggs. Uh, the fertile eggs will produce a female bee and the sterile eggs will produce a male. Um, the females then do all the work. They, um, they visit numerous flowers during the trip up to 75 and it takes about 25 trips apparently to collect enough nectar and pollen to feed each uh, egg that they've laid. The, the actual structure of one of the beehives, um, I've actually, I, I'm gonna jump ahead for one second. Um, this is what a uh, mason bee hive looks like. It's really a, a block with a series of holes in it. And mason bees get their name from the fact that they go out and collect mud and seal off chambers uh, in these holes that go into the block. So this is this slide shows a block that's been open. And I think you can see my mouse, I'll just point. Um, these are two halves of the same hole. So these cocoons you see in the bottom were from this um, other half of the hole here. You'll see that there is about, um, I think, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cocoons in this particular hole. And a couple of things to note, the, the ones that are gray are healthy cocoons. Those are eggs that have been laid and have moved on to the larvae stage. The um, chamber where my pointer's at right now, you'll see is full of pollen. But that, that could be one of two things, um, as I found out, is when, when the egg is first laid, laid the, the chamber is uh, filled with pollen and that to feed the larvae. And as the larvae emerges and spins its cocoon, it will use all that pollen up. So the cell that you see where the pollen is still there was either an egg that didn't uh, materialize and move on to the larvae stage or it could be one that was infected by mites and the mites will basically start um, devouring the flower and also destroy the larvae. So it's a bit of a warning sign. If I go to the top and show the chamber um, where you can see there were some healthy larvae followed again by a chamber, there's a good chance that this could be pollen mites that have emerged and taken over that cell. So it's something to be to be wary about. I didn't know that last year when I opened my um, my colony up, but this year when I uh, do open them up, if I have that kind of situation, I'll look at it with a magnifying glass, just determine exactly what the cause is. Another interesting thing with the mason bees is they basically can control the ratio of males to females. So if, <coughs> excuse me, if, 
um, the back of their hole for one of their um, brood chambers uh, is where my cursor is. What they'll do first is the first seven or eight cells that they lay will be female eggs, and then they can choose uh, for the last two or three cells near the opening to choose um, to lay unfertilized eggs, which will turn into males. So it's um, it's interesting that they can control the population, how many males they want, how many females they want. The um, males are laid toward the front of the chamber. So when you see the um, the block like this, the um, first bees to emerge from the block will be males. Um, a couple of things, you know, with regards to designing a hive, um, it's important that you have a way to um, extract the cocoons, either going into the uh, fall when you refrigerate them or in the spring, uh, you can do it at either time. But if you can't open them up and um, extract them, the risk, the risk you have is if there has been a bite infection or other disease, um, you're, you've really left that in your block and it will probably spread throughout your whole hive the next year. So um, I had pretty good success the first year. This was just my own uh, design. I took some, I think these were pine, pine boards and I, I taped them together, sandwiched them. And then on the seam, I drilled holes in and then duct taped the whole block together so that going into the fall or, or in the spring, when I wanted to extract the larvae, I would just remove the duct tape and undo the sandwich like this and extract the cocoons. Uh, a couple of things I've read is for some reason, the bees don't like cedar, they don't like white. So if you do make your own blocks, you should try not use cedar or something made out of white. Uh, there are a couple of other options, and this is a very popular one. Um, you can buy straws that you can just put in a, a rectangular enclosure for the mason bees. Um, these are very easy to use. Uh, you can buy them in uh, packages of 100 at a time. They're not very expensive. And <clears throat> when you're ready to extract the cocoons, uh, they unravel very easily. They just unwind, and you can e extract the cocoons easily. Uh, there's also another kind you can get that are made out of reeds. And what you can do is when you go to extract cocoons, you can just take a knife and split them at the end and they split in half very easily. Um, a couple of tips, and this was a mistake I made. If the channels are short, and I'll say four inches or less, you will get more males than you need. Um, and that's because the females will typically lay male eggs as they reach the end of the hole. So if you have a four inch channel for them to lay their eggs in, you'll get uh, maybe 30% males and 60% females, and you don't need that high of a ratio. If you're looking at expanding your hives, you're actually better off to do a seven inch hole or six or seven inch uh, five inches of which will then produce female eggs and two will be male eggs, and you'll get a better ratio of cocoons going into the next year. Um, some hives, uh, and I'll show this in a bit, have front covers to, uh, to prevent predators. So some hives are actually open like this with all the channels exposed to the environment. Sometimes people will put a cover with a, a larger hole just to protect uh, the hive from birds. Here's a picture of um, some of the co cocoon with the larvae in them that were from my um, hives this year. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but the bigger ones, such as this one I'm showing on top, is, is likely a female bee, and the smaller ones uh, are males. Uh, the bees are a little bit fussy about location. They prefer east facing. They like the morning sun, um, east facing or southeast facing, about five feet off the ground. Um, place them close to orchards. And some people will put a clay-based mud source 
like a bowl of mud right near the bottom of the hive, just so they've got good access uh, to making those chambers. And that, by the way, is the, is the reason mason bees get their name uh, of mason bees is the masonry work they do to create these little chambers. One big advantage of the mason bees is you can time the release of your larvae. So in the beginning of the year, typically we'll have our hazelnuts, currants, salmon berries coming out. So if you were wanting to use the mason bees to pollinate those trees, you could set your hives out or your homes out in March. Uh, if you were concerned about fruit trees, you could put your hives out in April when your cherry, peach and plum trees are blooming. Or if you have a lot of apple trees, you could put your, your hives out in May. Now, in, in our particular case, we've got, you know, hazelnuts, walnuts, cherry, peach, plum, and apple trees. Uh, they should have five hives. So I actually staggered each of my hives or homes as I put them out to time them so that um, in theory, the, the bees would emerge right when the flowers are at their peak and now to get the best pollination. Uh, predators and parasites, um, mites are the big one as, as, as we know from honeybees as well. Uh, birds are a predator and um, swallows will certainly take them because they are basically look like a fly and they, they don't sting. So in that case, a front cover over the hive may help a little bit. The mason bees can suffer as well from chalk brood and they're also attacked by wasps, um, as honeybees are. This is um, a picture of a, a mite infestation where um, somewhere in the process of the female going in and laying eggs brought in uh, pollen mites. And you can see here the, um, the chamber that should have had a healthy uh, growing larvae and it has been totally consumed by the mites. And um, but she did seal that off before they started expanding. So the next chamber over does have a healthy cocoon. So it's very important that I think when you harvest your cocoons, you look for these mite infections and um, it's, it's one good reason not to use a block that you use year after year that you can't clean. Some people just use a solid block and put it out and let the bees emerge naturally. But then if, they, if you have had a mite infection inside, all the emerging bees will basically capture some mites on the way out and you'll just spread the, the problem. You can see on the um, bottom picture here, um, a picture of a female and you can see she's just covered with mites from the end of her abdomen right to her, her feelers. She looks like she's got about 30 mites on her. So it, it certainly can be a big problem. Um, I've seen on, on the internet just doing some research that some people who are raising mason bees in large volumes will actually extract the cocoons and wash them in a mild bleach solution for mite and fungus control. Um, one of the most important things is to be able to clean those hive tubes, whether you're using a wood block, if using the straws, they're basically disposal. So that's one advantage of those is that you get a clean um, in sterile environment every year and you don't have to worry as much about the spread of mites. Um, chalk brood um, also can be a problem for mason bees as it can be for honeybees. The spores are brought in by the pollen and the bees traveling in other tubes will infect the other tubes. It's uh, one issue that if you have a problem in one tube, as the bee goes in and fills that tube with her eggs, she'll start crawling in and out all the other tubes till all the tubes are filled. And so if you do have something like chalk brood, it can spread very easily throughout your, your hive. These are uh, just a couple of pictures of hive designs. Um, on the one on the upper left, you can see that they basically used uh, the straws, they've just, inserted them in. Um, the one next to it on the right has a combination of straws and a wood block. And it also has a little chamber up here with a protective cover. 
what we do in the spring when we put the bees out, um, if we're using straws, of course they're empty. And what we've done is we've extracted the cocoons and we'll put them in a little chamber typically above the straws and just leave them sit there. And when the bees emerge, they will automatically find the straws or holes immediately below them. It's kind of handy just because of weather and so on. If you have a design like the one on the right that I'm showing, you can actually put the cocoons in and um, seal them off. They'll emerge through these vertical holes and fly out and then find the, um, the tubes and start laying their eggs. In the lower left, this, this shows just how simple a, a hive can be. It's just a series of straws put in a square box. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more protection just because of our climate here. If, if it is self-facing, it's possible that if you have rain coming in an angle that uh, rain could hit the edges of your straws. Uh, the one on the right, bottom right, shows a hive where they put a protective cover over that would perhaps just keep a, um, a bird like maybe a sap sucker or something like that from getting in and getting into the holes, uh, letting the bees go in and out easily. So. so that's it. That's my experience so far. I'm open for questions. Thanks so much, Alice. So much to learn. And the parallels between what the mason bees do and the honeybees do are is certainly there, but then they operate completely differently in how many eggs are laid, who controls the egg laying. It's, uh, yeah. it's quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, a quick question. Are you, so just to let everyone know, uh, please feel free to type your questions into the chat and then um, Al can answer them as they come in, the questions. But I have a quick question in that when you are, we know, well, a lot of us that are honey beekeepers, we know the kind of time that's required to really look after the honeybees uh, throughout the season. What, how, what sort of commitment do you have regarding the mason bees and, and caring for them as the season progresses? Like when do you, uh, like how much time do you spend? How do you check on them? Those kinds of things. As beekeepers, we sort of always think, oh, once a week, once a week, at least a couple of hours to keep them healthy, safe, and to see how the hives are going. Yeah. How do you find that sort of care and the difference in care? Well, it's a lot, definitely a lot less than the honeybees. A uh, couple of reasons. One is their life cycle is very short. They're really only active for about six weeks. So from the time the females emerge until the time their chambers are all filled up and uh, that's the end of their life cycle is only about six weeks. So in terms of maintenance, really it's as simple as putting your, your hive out, putting your tube structure, whether you use straws or wood block and setting the cocoons on top of that. And um, now at this time of the year, my, my blocks are all filled, sealed off and I'll leave them like that until the fall and then just put them in the fridge until the spring. So they're very, very low maintenance in that regard. You don't have to feed them. You don't have to, uh, do anything really. Perfect. Can you also put them in the freezer or only in the fridge? Um, I, I think just the fridge. Okay. Um, and how, if like, do you originally purchase the Mason bee cocoons or the eggs um, cocoons? I'm assuming is what you're saying from a supplier or do you, did you just sort of collect them naturally? Um, well, I got them from a friend in my case, but I, I know a lot of the local nurseries like Triple Tree and Grow and Gather, they will actually sell the straws, the homes and the cocoons. So, and in the next year, uh, I actually plan to, to build a number of homes and uh, brood chambers and, and provide them to people who are interested. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Al is interested in... Um in starting mason bees or, or has, sees them around their house and has them already? I just had one question in the context. You had mentioned mites. Are those varroa mites or are those a different uh, type of mite you're dealing with in, in the context of mason? Um, I think they are varroa on, on all the YouTube videos that I've seen, they call them pollen mites. So I don't, I don't know if that's a synonym or if they're different, but I suspect they're the same. So. 
Oh, might management. That's all we ever do as beekeepers, mm -hmm. might management. Just uh, one other thing I'll say is some people I know have actually just put out blocks without any cocoons and native mason bees will find them and quite often start to populate them on their own. So, but then you're, you're not as guaranteed as if you put the cocoons out. So how long does it take them to be viable? So you say when we are able to put them out so that we can tie them with the flowering of certain things. How about if we wanted to save them and have them come out um, in summer for pollinating, you know, second crop of raspberry or late blueberries, um, ones that only bloom in later, like in June, end of June and July? I'm not sure about that, but I think that they, they require a certain amount of uh, time for their larvae to grow from egg into larvae up to September. So I think if you put them out, in July, you may not have enough time for the larvae to mature before you put them in the fridge, but that's a guess. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about. Mm -hmm. When the timing, you do have some play, like you said, up until May. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask Al or type in the chat? Thank you so much, Al, for, for sharing this with us. I know that Agneta was very excited about the mason bees, and it's definitely an alternative beekeeping to help our pollinators along the way. You say that they like fruit trees and, and such over that. So planting in your garden, if I may ask just one last question, um, other plants to attract pollinators. Are mason bees also attracted to those flowers? Or what sort of uh, timing and flowers should we have in our garden for the mason bee pollination? Um, I think it's a little bit like honeybees. I, I think we know that if um, honeybees have a choice between clover and something else, they'll, they'll often go to their crop of choice. Um, I think the mason bees are the same. If they've got fruit trees, they'll prefer them. But if they don't have fruit trees close by, they will go to the flowers and, and so on. That's my understanding. But it's not as imp important that they have, uh, so to say, high nectar plants and then things flowering all the time. As long as they have something in the spring available to them, they're happy. Yeah, I, I think in the spring, there's so many things available to them. They will, they'll find the food. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time today. We really, really appreciate you coming out to speak with us. Okay, you're welcome.